we've concluded another year of Nintendo Power Magazine, so it's time to see what's going on in the rest of the video game industry and look at the N64 and what Nintendo is doing at the larger context. When we look from for the year of uh, June 1997 to May 1998, or 12-month period, I should say, with my major source here, as with the last time, being Next Gen Magazine. Now, at this point in time, we started to see an increase in video game coverage and reviews on websites through the launch of sites like VideoGames.com, later known as GameSpot, and the Imagine Games Network, later known as, or currently known as IGN. Both of these websites have undergone spectacular changes in their interface and backend since this period, which makes it unfortunately somewhat difficult to dig through their site's backlogs to find historical news stories from during this period. I can search for specific news stories in their archive, but finding stories in, but like, just finding the stories in particular from a date range is tricky. The earliest articles I can find in a chronological hunt on GameSpot go back to 2000. IGN has articles that date back to 1997, such as a rundown of titles at Space World, but I can't go back to just 1997 and see what they were posting about on the site when it first launched. It's a fine setup for surfacing new articles, and certainly that's what they're looking for, but it's crappy when it comes to historical research. First up, let's look at the larger industry as a whole. For starters, the video game industry was still under threat due to content issues in 97 and 98. While the ESA had managed to mollify legislators for a time with through the ESRB, Jack Thompson entered the scene, seeking to make a name for himself by so going after game, video games and video game publishers and their deep pockets through litigation in the wake of school shootings like the Paducah High School shooting. Now, by much later in his career, he'd become something of a punching bag for what, at that point, he considered a holy crusade against video games. But at this point, it's pretty clear that while the industry was aware of the threat he could become, it wasn't sure the wider, to wider audiences whether he's some guy just trying to get money in a settlement or if he's trying to make a name for himself in doing for video games what Dr. Frederick Wertham had done for comics. And considering that Wertham undoubtedly set comics back a, possibly a century with his actions, because I argue they certainly hasn't recovered, the industry took him as a Wertham, which honestly I'd consider to be a reasonable conclusion to draw. That said, the discussion of violence in video games in the wake of Thompson's lawsuits did lead to the start of some discussion of what video games are in terms of the content of the games and how we interact with these worlds. Not just in terms of dealing with a situation where so many games have the player's primary or even only verb be to shoot, but also in terms of larger issues of how women are depicted in video games with the rise of Laura Croft, with the character of Barrett in Final Fantasy VII leading to questions about how we depict people of color, to the side questions of do we cut slack to designers from other countries when they get depictions of people of color wrong? Also, among all of this, we have, in the wake of the success of Myst, we have the upcoming release of Riven, a similar style of game, and the question there of, is Myst, are Myst and Riven actually games, or are they not? And history has shown them to be games, but that debate is still ongoing here, much as we would have this later with games like um, What Remains of Edith Finch, leading to the question of, are, is what, that game a video game? are walking, quote-unquote, walking simulators, games where there isn't the same risk of death necessarily, also gone home falling in this category, do those count as video games? In, for the record, I think they do. Arcades in this period were also trying to reinvent themselves, particularly as consoles began to be able to do a better and better job of replicating the performance of game um, arcade hardware, in some cases where the consoles themselves are using the same hardware that the arcades were, are, or rather the other way around, where the arcade um, boards are modeled on upcoming or existent game uh, consoles. With this, we get the slow rise of the st or starting rise of the barcade, particularly with the Dave and Buster's chain also starting to get widespread around this point along with sort of arcade hub, destination arcades like Gameworks in Seattle. This period also saw the tragic death of Gunpoint Yokoi in a car accident. 
he left Nintendo after the company basically shunted him to the banishment room after the fail failure of the Virtual Boy, at which point he'd gone to Bandai and designed the Wonder Swan using the same design philosophies in terms of simplicity of design, simplicity of the hardware to make it affordable to manufacture, which led to the success of the Game Boy. And with Square and a bunch of other developers and publishers who had already cut bait in Nintendo with the N64 design, working on porting games or designing new games for the Wonder Swan hardware. And at this point, the platform was at least in Japan. It hadn't gotten released in the US yet, starting to look like it could potentially become a real threat to Nintendo's handheld hegemony. That said, with the loss of Yukoi, I wonder if with it, the platform had lost its biggest champion inside of Bandai, allowing to it to not be able to achieve similar heights, not even at the level of the Game Gear, never, never mind becoming a serious contender. Also with this, and it does bear mentioning, this is the first major death in the video game industry in this respect, and leading to the point where the industry, uh, industry of people covering it, the magazines and now websites, now have to contemplate how we handle the coverage of the deaths of effectively celebrities within the game industry. Do we need to have, much as the New York Times does, a bunch of New York Times, of like a big stack of obituaries ready to go when somebody tragically passes? Next up, let's take a look at each of the consoles and see how they're doing. First off, the Matsushita M2 and the 3DO architecture. Are you serious? In all seriousness, while there were some rumblings of titles to that were scheduled to come out for the platform, none of them were actually ever really released. With that out of the way, let's get serious with the Sega Saturn. After being somewhat tied with the N64 for third place, the Sega Saturn has been declining in its fortunes. Their releases have slowed down considerably compared to the very recent case of PS1 and the growing rate of the N64s, cartridges are making it out of the manufacturing channel. And while there's still been some very real bangers in there, like uh, Marvel superheroes, we haven't seen the same growth of the library that PS1 has had, nor have we seen as many games getting ported to the Saturn at the same time as PS1. That said, the Saturn is getting a few RPGs to show how much stronger it is on this point of the N64 with it being clear, particularly for the US branch of Sega, that this is one of the big weak points for the N64 alongside RPGs, and this is a place where they could theoretically gain some ground with releases of Grandia, Shining Force 3, that was the first episode of it, Shining the Holy Ark, and Panzer Dragoon Saga. That said, these can't quite compare with the quantity, and in some instances quality of these titles and these genres on the N64, plus that the fighting games that the Saturn has, which are certainly one of its strong points, including titles like Dead or Alive, aren't enough to keep the Saturn alive. Oddly, it's let the Saturn enter the position of being the turbo graphics of the con this console generation, a platform with quality games and some really strong genres, but never quite getting the market penetration needed the clock from third which isn't helped by a lack of third-party support for a variety of reasons, particularly when it comes to difficulties in software development. Next up is the Sony PlayStation. This past year has clinched how the PlayStation has become the platform for RPGs in the US. We've got US release dates for Final Fantasy VII, Wild Arms, Final Fantasy Tactics, and a bunch of other console RPGs. We've gotten sequels to Tekken and other fighting games as well, showcasing the strength of the PlayStation for 3D fighting games, while the Saturn has done a very decent job of showcasing how well that platform handles 2D fighting games. The PS1 has also further demonstrated what it's capable of when it comes to racing games with the release of Gran Turismo, after an already strong start with Ridge Racer and its sequels, showing the graphical capabilities of the platform for fast driving action. In all, the PlayStation during this period has since clinched its position and the top spot of console platforms in terms of library, again, both quantity and quality, and consequently sales as well. Sony learned everything 
from the success of the, of the Super Nintendo and applied that here. In all, during this period, every month I could constantly look at Next Gen or another magazine published during this period, either a generalist game coverage magazine or one that specializes on the PlayStation and find a PlayStation game that was out and during that in that issue and that I wanted to play. Next up, let's take a look at where the N64 stands among consoles. This span of time really shows some serious games coming out of the taps for the N64. It's not the deluge the PlayStation has, nor do we have the diversity of quality games the PlayStation has. Indeed, going through Nintendo Power retrospectives during this period, I have had a few issues where my pick for the issue was less, this is what I actually want to play, this is something I want to add to my collection, so must buy for me and more, I gotta pick something this issue, I guess. But it still felt like I was, like there were less games like that. There were more games that I did want to play coming out this year than in the previous year of Nintendo Power during the launch period. Wrapping things up, the PC. This year, we have the buildup to Windows 98 and with it, the further development of the DirectX platform and APIs for game development, allowing a framework for PC games and PC game graphical hardware to work to further simplify a lot of the issues with 3D acceleration that plagued PC gaming in the MS-DOS and early Windows era. Additionally, we are reaching a point where what is for the time high-speed internet, by which I mean DSL, is getting spread out all to more and more portions of the country, in addition to having generally some various forms of high-speed networks, again for the time, across college campuses, which makes for a further rise in not only online multiplayer games through WAN parties or LAN parties, that sort of thing, but also with the rise of PC matchmaking services like Heat, along with the introduction of Battle.net for Diablo and QSpy, which will later become the GameSpy platform the year previous to this. However, the biggest thing to come out of all of this is Ultima Online, and with it, the rise of various new games in the genre that we now call MMORPGs. We've had these before with MUDs. We've had them with software like the Neverwinter Nights platform on AOL, powered by SSI's Gold Box Engine, but this is something new entirely. And consequently, we have numerous other companies working on their own forms of the genre. Um, and in particular, this period sees Sony announcing and showing initial gameplay footage of their own MMORPG EverQuest during this period, though we will not see a release for the game for a few more years. Further, on the first-person shooter front, id Software has released Quake 2. John Romero and others have, spun, have left id to start Ion Storm. And with that, also, various forms of the immersive sim start getting further development. And on top of all of this, all of this rise of online multiplayer gaming led to the spreading also to real-time strategy games. Command & Conquer, Red Alert, and Warcraft 2 grew in online popularity during this period. I believe this is the period where Warcraft 2 received the Battle.net edition, along with also there being rumblings of the next RTS to come from Blizzard, StarCraft. Indeed, this is a boom time for PC gaming to a degree that possibly was not matched until more recently, particularly during the pandemic with the catch being that while development in video game hardware um, and video card hardware now hasn't exactly plateaued, improvements can feel more incremental to the standard audience and also run into other side issues unrelated to the hardware, like video cards that can theoretically output heavy-duty HDR, except they're going to hook the home monitors that don't support it or ostensibly do, but don't do it well. By comparison, in 97 and onwards, the gains in hardware iterations were very rapid, very dramatic, but also very expensive. Adjusted for inflation, some of the video cards released during this period that were on the cutting edge could cost as much of several of the, as several of the highest end video cards now. So there's a lot of good stuff happening on PC at this time, but it's not as financially accessible to general users as now. This period also coming out of the PC market led to the question of, do we need big publishers? At this point, the answer is yes, because the game industry is dependent on brick and mortar retail, which means you have to make physical goods, which means publishers to have the infrastructure to manufacture them. 
further, and this would persist up into the launch of digital storefronts on home game consoles with the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, we are still in a period where in order to get your game on a console, you must have a publisher. You cannot independently publish a game for the big three, potentially soon to become big two game consoles at this point, especially the N64. And honestly, even now to this day, we still have varying answers on whether you need publishers because of how expensive games, particularly of the AAA or even the shrinking AA sphere are to make and the need for promotion in order to get eyes on your game in crowded platforms like GOG, Steam, and itch.io compared to the risk of getting grabbed by something like the Embracer Group only to get shut down and lose everything so that your publisher can appeal share or be shareholders for line quickly go up. In all, this period sees something of a shift. Looking with 2020 hindsight, you can clearly see how this date of the Saturn here slowly curves towards Sega getting out of the console hardware game entirely after the failure of the Dreamcast. But you can also see how theoretically they could have managed to turn things around with the Dreamcast hardware. The, we could pull out of the death spiral at this point. The PlayStation at, during this period has firmly entrenched itself as the market basically for people who liked in, uh, Super Nintendo games. Because much of what Super Nintendo audiences really liked, like RPGs, like fighting games, carried over to the PlayStation. We got fighting games on the Saturn as well, but we didn't quite get like the big balance of both, especially in this instance with Namco and Square going to the PlayStation. Additionally, while the N64 is finding its footing, it's not there yet. It has managed to surpass the Saturn, but that's less due to them like the N64 like really getting it, though we've certainly had some big hits here like, well, Goldeneye. But we don't have, like a lot of this is also the, the slowly kind of flagging to a degree of the uh, Saturn in this respect. However, at this point though, DirectX and Windows, and uh, uh, 95, 98 have managed to bring the PC into a brand new era of relevance, even more so than the year previous. We are no longer in a situation where if you want to play the good looking or good sounding version of a game, you have to do it on a console. The best versions of Quake 2 and Diablo are on PC. The best version of Quake are on PC. And if you want to play these new MMORPGs like Ultima Online, there's no way to play them on consoles. So we're going to get real-time strategy games coming out more seriously on consoles. At this point, we've already gotten some Command & Conquer games, but it's not going, but they aren't going to thrive as well and have a similar scene behind them as the PC versions do. This is also helped by the fact that PCs have really, really successful online multiplayer. And at this point, and indeed for the next gen or couple of generations to come, or at least the next generation to come. Neither do, well, consoles. It's not going to be until the era of the PlayStation 3, Xbox, and Xbox 360 before we get seriously successful online multiplayer. We'll get some of that with the PlayStation 2, but it's not really going to be, like I said, quite, say, ready for prime time in the same way as it is on PC. Next month, we return Nintendo Power proper. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.